Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 34, through chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice with you, or invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name for you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they came, he looked on Eliab, the oldest son, and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had moments or days or whole seasons where you felt like you could just do nothing right? You start the day by spilling your coffee, which makes you late for work, which means you can't leave early to go to your kid's basketball game, and you just feel like you can't get ahead, no matter how much you try. And maybe it isn't just a day where that's happening to you. Maybe there's a long period of time where you feel like someone or something is out to get you. And then you look around and you see someone else looks completely put together. They have the clean house, the nice car, the job they love. I mean, we've all played that game at some point, right? One of the characters in the Bible who really just can't seem to get it right is Saul. Many of us grew up hearing about David, the shepherd boy who took out the giant Goliath with a slingshot and a stone and became this great king over Israel and wrote lots of poetry. But before David, there was Saul. The Israelites begged for a king to rule over them and try to unite the people of Israel, something that their former leaders, the judges, could not accomplish. 
At first, the prophet Samuel rejected these cries for a king because he felt like it went against God, the, the true king. But as Samuel got older, the people needed a godly leader, and God told Samuel to listen to them and anoint a king. He went out and anointed this great warrior, Saul, to be their king. And Saul was pretty popular at first. He was strong, handsome, tall. He won a lot of battles, and he didn't seem overly eager to take the throne and rule over his people. However, Saul's rule was doomed from the start. It seems like no matter what Saul did, he was a disappointment to Samuel and a disappointment to God. Right before our passage starts today, Samuel and Saul had just had another big fight. Saul tried to repent and make amends, but it was too late. In Samuel's eyes, and apparently in God's eyes, Saul's monarchy was at an end. He would go on to rule until his death, as kings do, but he was no longer the king of God's favor. Almost immediately, God sends Samuel out to find the next king. Now David was the polar opposite of Saul. David was smaller, younger, not a great warrior. Uh, David would rather be out singing songs and tending the sheep than participating in politics or battle. And David had all these big brothers who looked and acted kingly in Samuel's eyes, but in chapter 16, verse 7, God says to Samuel, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Even though David did not look or act like a king you or I would expect, Samuel anointed him, then and there, to be the next king over the people Israel. Now, David did not take the throne right away. He had giants to slay first. But eventually, David took the throne and became an even more remarkable leader than Saul. I believe there are three movements to this story and three, we, three ways we can see God and connect to our lives. The first movement is failure. Failure. Saul had failed as a king. He may have looked pretty okay in the eyes of the people, but he went against God for the sake of his own interests. I think it's fair to say that we've all done the same thing too. It's in our human nature to give in to the pressure to do what we want and what we think other people expect of us, regardless of what God may have to say about it. Even great kings who have been anointed by God will fail. Failure is inevitable. And the sooner we realize it, the sooner we can start to pick up the pieces and move on. Because while failure is inevitable, we know that God is merciful. It's hard to see God's mercy in this story. In fact, if you read the passages right before this one, God's pretty harsh. But I think when we focus on failure, you know, our own failure, the failures of others, and the ways in which we feel God has failed us, we miss the bigger picture. God is bigger than our failures. God already knows how and when we will fail, <clears throat> and yet God loves us and shows that love through Jesus Christ and the enduring presence of the Holy Spirit. We may not feel or understand this mercy in the moment of our failures, but God is faithful and will be there with us when we pick up the pieces. The second movement in the story is promise. By promise, I mean hope or anticipation. God chose David to be king because of something God saw in David's heart. Honestly, we cannot know what this something was, and if we read further in the Bible, we find out some of the most horrible things that David did, and we wonder exactly what it was God saw in his heart. But God knowing our failures, still sees something beautiful in us, something beloved about us that we may not always see or understand. 
But this does not make it okay to continue assuming God will have mercy on us and therefore we can live how we want to live and be hurtful to others. While we can acknowledge that God still loves us in our failures, there are also evils in this world we see and experience and can choose to fight against. Hate is not something God planned for us, and yet hate is a part of our daily reality, but maybe not for those of us who are privileged enough to avoid it, but for those who are poor, indigenous, black, Asian, or who identify as LGBTQIA, hate has become a hurdle to living life as God desires. And we must realize that no matter how this world sees us, we know that God sees not as humans see, but looks on the heart and sees promise. No matter what this world is telling you, God sees promise within you and chooses you despite the ways others have oppressed you. And while these words are comforting, they must be supported by action and intention. If we believe that God sees promise in us and in our fellow human beings, we must see it there too and advocate for that life of promise. We cannot change centuries of cruelty and prejudice all at once. But we can start this work today by changing our hearts, which will lead to change of action. If God is a God of promise and of human hearts, it's not too late to start. The third movement of this story is anointing. After the failure of Saul and the promise of David, Samuel anoints David. Anointing in this passage is strange for many reasons. A king is anointed while there's another king still in power. Uh, the anointing does not take place in some grand hall or temple or sacred space, but in the home of shepherds. The anointing of David is simple, humble, and private. When you think of anointing, you might think of oils or priests doing the anointing of the sick or last rites or Maybe you think of something like baptism or ordination. But here we see anointing as a quiet encounter with the divine. When I worked as a hospital chaplain intern last summer, I was once called to the room of a woman who had miscarried her child. And this woman was alone with her baby. We held the child together, weeping, praying, telling stories about all her hopes for her baby. And at one point I could tell there was something missing, something she needed but didn't know what to ask for. She needed some sort of ritual. And I remembered, for whatever reason, I remembered that I had a bottle of essential oils in my bag and I asked if she would like me to anoint her and her child. And she agreed. It may sound strange because it wasn't like I was some priest anointing this person into some great position or calling. It wasn't a bottle of some sacred oil or holy water. I don't even remember what words we said. But in that moment, we were just humans in need of a sacred space, who needed to feel God right with us, who needed this scent, this touch to remind us of the Holy Spirit, who needed to know that somehow there's a tomorrow. God sees our hearts and chooses us because of what God sees there. We do not always understand, and sometimes we fail. But we are the anointed children of God, and we are brought nearer to the Holy Spirit to prepare us for the task ahead. I do not know what we are each individually or collectively called to do, but I believe the prophet Micah that God instructs us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. So, 
Go out into the world and feel the presence of the Spirit with you. Remember who you are and the one who has anointed you to this task. Amen.